the future. What's up, Monday Geeks? Mr. V here. Welcome to another video, guys. So in today's video, we are going to take it on the road, guys. We are going to go out and talk to the actual people that are behind this wonderful company that I've been talking about here on the channel. So I'm super excited to kind of bring them on. If you guys know, I started profiling this company here on the channel before any other body uh, here on YouTube or even in the media. So uh, again, super excited to have somebody to come here and really take us in depth into their technology. And so the company I'm talking about here again, guys, is Arriver. And if you guys know, this is a UK-based uh, electric car manufacturer. I, I say electric car manufacturer, but there's so much to it, which we're going to learn about. Today, we have the president, Mr. Avinash Rogobar, on the channel to talk about Arriver. So I'm super excited. Hey, Mr. Avinash, welcome to the channel. Uh, thanks. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So for all the viewers, I saw the video. Um, a close friend of mine sent it to me, and it was... Um, uh, it was amazing. I think you really understood what we were actually uh, doing. And, right. um, and yeah, I'm really happy to be on and just take you through some of the story and background about uh, what we do at Arrival. That's awesome. Uh, so just before we get started, uh, for people that don't quite understand Arrival, can you just talk a little bit about the story of Arrival? Sure. So we were founded in 2015, actually, and we've actually been in stealth mode um, for the last uh, four odd years, we sort of came out of stealth mode in um, at the end of 2019 with an uh, investment. Uh, Hyundai and Kia uh, right. invested 100 million in in Arrival, wow. but we've got uh, over 1,300 people, uh, predominantly engineering. So 90% engineering of that half is software, the other half yeah. are I would say automotive robotics. Um, and what we've really created is a new method of designing and producing vehicles. So right. We started from the ground up. We were trying to answer the question, how do you make electric vehicles the same price as diesel and fossil fuel equivalents? Because there once you, you do that, then you're really able to basically change the whole market over to being uh, electric. There's no reason why you shouldn't go electric right. if it's a similar price and it's cheaper to run and it's a better yeah. product. There and then go. we focus on the commercial vehicle segment first because that's, that's really rapidly growing. The corporations have ESG goals, you know, the, the governments really want to move um, uh, a lot of the car park, as they say, into being electric. So we thought mm -hmm. that was the first uh, area to start. And we've announced a bus and a van. Uh, we've we've got, uh, also got a small vehicle platform coming out as well. Okay. Uh, but a lot of this is pioneered on, on these micro factories, which are these, you know, instead of taking these huge, really expensive um, uh, production lines, we are... Uh, creating these small 20,000 square meter micro factories that produce the vehicles in our lineup. And to do that, we had to really develop a whole lot of technology and a lot of IP within the company. There you go. Uh, you touched on some key things there. Uh, number one is that you guys, at some point, you're going to go from commercial to regular vehicles for people. Is that, is that breaking news here on the channel? Well, well, what I would say is that the, the, the initial focus is on the commercial vehicle segment and it's okay. large enough and there's still multiple segments to, for us to really enter. Okay. Uh, you know, there is, uh, but then there's also things that we're doing around mobility. So, you know, think about uh, the different types of mobility transport modes of transportation. Right. Uh, a lot of uh, what we're doing when you combine the, the vehicles and, and we call them devices on wheels. So they're essentially all connected. Um, and when you combine that with, with the software layers that we have, right. you're really able to use a lot of that data to create sort of new modalities of transportation. Okay. So, you know, I mean, stay tuned on that. But for now, you know, it's very important to stay focused. We have the commercial vehicle yeah. segment to go after. Awesome. And the second point that you, you talked about was these micro factories. Can you kind of take us in depth as to how that is so different from the current um, OEM model and why it's very important? So, you know, I spent um, about two decades in the traditional uh, automotive world, in and out. Uh, um, and, you know, what, what tends to happen, whether it's a startup or a traditional player, whenever there's a new vehicle platform being de designed and developed, there's almost this sort of assumption that you manufacture it through the, the process that Henry Ford started, you know, decades ago. Right. And of course, it works. But the issue with it is you have to make hundreds of thousands of vehicles for it to be profitable. Mm -hmm. And that area hasn't really been tackled. The, the rest of the things have you know, gone through a lot of, uh, I would say, there's been innovation, 
Um, but that hasn't had a step change in, in a generation. Right. So we looked at, okay, how do you fundamentally produce these electric vehicles at the right price point, but do that in a way that you can be profitable at any volume, then you unlock something special. There you right? go. And to do that though, you have to start really at a blank sheet. You have to ask the question, well, you know, like what most, most, most happen, uh, most uh, startups, for example, if they're going to go do production, they, you know, will get a contract manufacturer or um, they will go and buy a plant. But right. uh, once you buy a plant, you're kind of stuck down that path. You know, you mm -hmm. spent a couple of billion and it's the same problem the OEMs have. They have to amortize that plant. You can't just, you know, you spend a couple of billion on it. You right. better make a product out of it. So we saw that that was a barrier to what we wanted to do, uh, which is democratize the electrification. How do we bring that anywhere, right? right. It doesn't matter if I'm, in, you know, if I'm in Minnesota in the US or if I'm in London or if I'm in Mumbai or if I'm in Johannesburg. I should mm -hmm. be able to produce these vehicles locally and serve the local mobility requirements because every city and every area is different. That's right. But to do that, it, it took five years of, of really deep engineering, right? So, you know, we've got things like the composite materials. The composite materials that we have um, basically starts as a fabric and we've got unique IP that um, creates panels from it. These okay. panels are lighter and more durable than steel. By doing that, um, we don't need the metal stamping plant. So we're starting to really remove, reduce the, the capex and the space required for a factory. Right. But also we're able to color the fabric so that we can have... Uh, the, not, no need for paint wow. uh, because the, the panels themselves come out in the color. So then wow. you take the paint shop out. So, you know, innovations that's leading to reducing the factory. That's awesome. Then we design and develop all of our own components. Uh, well, we've developed the ones that are, I would say, smart and um, connected and plug and play, the ones that can be swapped in and out. So the batteries, uh, high voltage, low voltage components like the human machine interface, the compute module, um, DC, DC, all of these can be. Uh, swapped in and out of the vehicle so you can upgrade the vehicle over time. Right. But we designed them to be assembled in the micro factories. Compare that to the sort of traditional approach where you're getting, you know, a bunch of different parts at all different dimensions and you're spending a couple of years trying to package it into a vehicle and then you figure out how to manufacture it. Ours is a harmonious loop. Every go. component, the skateboard, the composites are all designed to be manufactured within these micro factories right so once we had developed that technology then we we actually considered a micro factory as a product in and of itself mm -hmm. and what it unlocks is amazing it means that you know our micro factory can produce 10,000 vans uh, thousand buses uh, we use a cell based approach instead of a line yeah so these we basically have these robotic cells inside the factory and uh, we have autonomous mobile robots that move the, the parts from cell to cell okay. to do specific operations. Okay. Right. No, it's, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so we end up um, um, being able to do multiple vehicle types by simply reorganizing how the, um, the, the, the component, the parts move from cell to cell. Whereas a line, the typical line runs at one speed and you have to do all of the different developments uh, sorry, the different I, assembly on that line. line. And then every time you have a new vehicle, you have to add another line. Whereas yeah. for us, we simply change the, the operational okay. order. I mean, it's, it's, it's really groundbreaking. So, that so these, it, uh, would you describe sorry. that as component-based uh, development? Yeah, I'd call it like a modular-based. Modular-based, okay, got it. The cells yeah. act like a module, the components are like a module, the, the um, materials... I like a module, the skateboard itself is like a module and they all fit together and can be assembled in a micro factory. Okay. And these so, are, so go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, based on that, uh, would you describe Arriver as more of a technology company or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, we are building uh, technology and systems that build vehicles and the vehicles that come out, are, you know, best in class, real strong focus on user experience. Right. I know you've seen some of the, the video and photos of the bus and the van. I mean, mm -hmm. they're incredible. Um, but they're also lighter because of the uh, materials and approach we use. So you need better range efficiency. So they're best in class vehicles coming out, better payload, uh, lower weight, better cargo volume. But it's done through a, you know, a harmonious ecosystem that can produce um, these, these products. And that okay. is very heavy tech focus. So yeah. definitely uh, it's a technology company 
producing electric commercial electric vehicles. There you go. There you go. Okay. So um, as we all know, one of the key components of uh, electric vehicles is the battery technology. And so we've yeah. had these different uh, uh, you know, companies coming out and telling us you no know, groundbreaking. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the technology that you guys are using for your battery? I mean, just what you expect us to, to know not in depth and how that compares to uh, what we currently have in the market today. Yeah, so we use batteries from LG Chem, the cells. Yeah. We do the modules. So we've got some new, really unique technology in terms of how um, uh, we, we do the cooling and how we assemble the actual uh, module. So right. we don't do a battery pack. What we've got is a battery module. Okay. And those battery modules can be um, sized according to the commercial uh, operator's needs. And got it. Actually, this is, this is pretty important. So... If you have a typical battery pack that you're seeing, you know, it works in the retail segment. You're trying to keep as much range as you can. And, and, and battery is the most expensive part of the, of the vehicle. Essentially. Right. In the commercial segment, if you look at commercial fleets, some vehicles are doing, you know, 50 miles. Some are doing 300 miles. Mm -hmm. But if you're running a vehicle that's doing 50 miles but paying for 300 miles of range, you know, you're really, you're, you, you've got an inefficient system there. Mm -hmm. So with the arrival uh, battery modules, what you're able to do, just think of like plug and play like a laptop. Right. You're able to just size the battery capacity as you need. You just add more modules or take them away depending on uh, what the actual commercial requirement is. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, unique technology uh, within how we uh, design and assemble that, that battery module. Let's jump into like the big one. So right now you guys have about $1.2 billion in pre-orders. Um, what's, the, what's the goal here to try to go to market and have or start doing some delivery? When should people start expecting to see some of this stuff out there? So we've actually been prototyping. Um, so our components have been in testing for the last two years. Okay. We've got prototype buses, we've got prototype vans. Uh, the, uh, the buses and the vans will be going to, to customers for trials uh, in, the, in the new year. Okay. And then we're looking to produce the, the bus actually uh, towards the end of next year. And the van will be out in, you know, in the wild uh, middle of the year after. So we're really um, on that uh, direct path to uh, you know, start a production and mm -hmm. because the technology and the, and the prototypes are mature enough. So you know, we're in a... We're in a position now where actually what we're looking at is how do we now start to scale the business given that the products are coming. And so okay. you know, something special for your viewers, we just announced about an hour ago or so that we've uh, announced our uh, US headquarters uh, in Charlotte. We'll go. be looking to employ 150 odd people there. Uh, that goes along with our uh, first micro factory in the US, which is in Rock Hill in South Carolina. Okay. So, you know, we're starting the, the rollout of the uh, micro factories and different um, uh, engineering centers. We got the breaking news here <laughs> right from the president himself. So I, I really do. I really do appreciate that. So um, you for the, on the commercial side, are you guys, do you guys have any contracts yet with like city buses or how is that going to work? Yeah. So um, the way the, the sales work on the buses is slightly different to the van. So on the van, yeah. as you mentioned, um, you know, we've, we've already got 1.2 billion in, in orders. Mm -hmm. We have uh, UPS, we've ordered 10,000 with the option to order an additional 10,000. Mm -hmm. We have, we're in late stage sales just in the UK for uh, um, um, uh, 5,000 per annum. So, you know, the, the numbers, the, the interest in the, in the product is really, um, uh, really picking up and, and um, I don't see, uh, any reason why if you can buy a better product at the right price and have right. lower operating costs, why you're not going to shift to electric. I mean, that, that's the key and arrival mm -hmm. enables that. In terms of the bus, the buses, um, typically, you know, the segment sort of split up into private operators and public operators. Um, a lot of uh, government owned uh, bus fleets as well. Right. And in that it's more of a case of running the buses in the trials and then moving to um, direct sales of, of the actual product. So we've got LOIs for the bus mm -hmm. and in next, in the, over the next, um, you know, six to, to 12 months, they'll be in trials and we'll be uh, expecting those uh, buses to um, uh, generate the initial revenue for the company. What's, what's important about our bus. Uh, I mentioned the eight ton uh, unladed weight with an eight ton payload. Right. Uh, you know, we have, they're fully connected. So on the side, for example, we've got screens that can do advertising, geolocation, uh, screens inside to provide any geo, uh, geolocated information, route right. information, 
Uh, we can monitor, the, the operators can monitor the fleet and do predictive maintenance. I mean, this is really incredible um, technology. And, you know, uh, fully flat floor. So right. you can serve it, maintain, it, maintain it really quickly. So we're, we're thinking about it from the user experience of the operator, but also the driver and then the user. All three really need, and, and actually service and maintenance, all mm -hmm. four need to be considered, you know, with myopic view on how do they do this day to day. And a lot of that five years we've been talking about where we're in stealth, we've been chatting to operators, we've been working with them both on the bus and the van on how do you actually create the ideal product for this commercial segment. It's, it's critically important. Right, that's awesome. So um, one key thing that I, I see to me logically, you go from you know, fossil fuel to electric vehicle, the next logical step to me is autonomous vehicle. So what are you guys doing from that, that angle? Because I, I know you guys are thinking far beyond just electric vehicles. So we talk are. a little bit about the plan you guys have for autonomous So what I, let, let me think about what I, what, I can, uh, what I can say. So I've got a, um, quite a deep background in autonomous vehicles from um, my previous history. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you've seen Robo Race. Yep. It, that, but, was, that was going to be my next question. So... so <laughs> Robo Race is, uh, for, for your viewers, an autonomous racing series, Arrival. Um, it's Arrival Tech, uh, and Arrival has a racing team in it, and it's really about getting universities and partners to try out like the craziest algorithms to get um, the autonomous vehicles to go as right. fast and do all the sorts of movements that you couldn't do on the real ro ro road. But as you can imagine, that is a great way for the team to understand what are the systems, whether they be hardware or software, right. that's going to be needed for our vehicle platforms to be enabled to be autonomous. So I would say there's sort of two things that we're actively doing now that, that I can speak about. One is the actual vehicle platform itself, the skateboard plus the, uh, mo the modular components. Right. Those components can swap in and out. And what's important about that is when autonomous is ready, road going autonomy is ready, we're able to just swap in and out the hardware that's required for autonomy. So the same wow. asset is autonomous ready today and can be converted for full road going. Okay. So that's important because if you're buying a vehicle now, you don't, especially in the commercial segment, you don't want in three or four or five years or when a full road going autonomous is there, you don't have to buy another vehicle, right? You want to be able to upgrade the one you've got. But the second thing we're doing is we are actually, um, going to be, uh, well, we're in the active development of depot autonomous operations. Okay. So that is actually things that, uh, an area that existing technology for autonomy can actually handle. So a depot is a controlled environment. Right. right? And you're not going to have any sort of um, wild edge case use, use cases. It's controlled. You can get from the charging station to the cleaning station, to the docking station in full autonomy. You can rearrange, I don't know if you've ever been, for example, to a bus depot in, yep. in the night and you're trying to see them organize all the buses. It's it you know, crazy. <laughs> yeah, those sorts of things that you know, the team's working on um, you know, using autonomy for because it's really good and efficient um, use case for today's uh, capability of autonomous vehicles. But we'll be ready for when we do go full road going. Okay. So uh, one key thing I want to see here is we, we talked about technology and that's huge for you guys. Um, and some, do you guys see at some point a rival being uh, maybe a supplier to other companies because of the technology that you guys have built? Uh, I think, you know, when, when you think about the fact that a rival is creating the systems that are creating vehicles and not just the vehicles themselves, right. deep integration. There's a, there's a range of possibilities open to us. Okay. What I, what I will say is, for example, Hyundai, Kia, and Arrival, uh, we have our partnership where we are jointly developing uh, vehicles together. So you okay. can imagine, um, there's not much I can really disclose about it, except to say you, you can imagine that there is um, uh, technologies from both sides that are, that are coming together and they've got the global scale. Um, so uh, watch this space. But again, I think what's really important is uh, we, we've achieved what we've achieved to date and there's still a lot to do, but we've achieved that through focus. Okay. And so right okay. now the focus has to be on, you know, we've got the, these factories coming up. We've got the initial production run. We've still got a large commercial vehicle segment uh, to go after. So that's our primary focus. But the upside uh, potential of the company 
you know, includes things like, uh, you know, autonomy that we discussed. Right. But, you know, what, what we are able to do with our components and our materials, the software stack, you know, there's significant, I would say, future potential opportunities for arrival. But it's very important to get to stay focused and get the first vehicles in customers hands and driving over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. All right. That's awesome. Um, and so one key thing I wanted to bring up here, too, is uh, recently in the news, uh, Gene Kramer uh, you know, mentioned the fact that a driver is the son or the daughter of Tesla. And I was like, oh, OK. I, I, was, I was hoping that it will probably be brothers or, you know, it could be stepbrothers. <laughs> but he says son or daughter. What do you say about that? Well, what I'd say is I think you recognize the potential of arrival even earlier. So, yeah. you know, congrats to you. But I think, um, I, I think that, that uh, Kramer, you know, I, I think that just means he really understood the, the growth potential and the fact that, you know, similar to Tesla, there's a heavy tech focus here. But what Tesla was able to do, and I think it's similar in terms of what arrival is able to do, is really shift the mindset. Like if you think about what people were thinking about electric vehicles before mm -hmm. Tesla really came out and showed everybody just how amazing they can be. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's us in the commercial vehicle segment to begin with, right? Yeah. That is just taking, you know, cutting edge technology, applying it to an underserved market and really going out there. But we are, we are different too. So, you know, I don't know if we're, we're the son or daughter of Tesla. Maybe you're right. <laughs> stepbrother or, or, you know, close friend or whatever it is. But, exactly. You know, we, we're, using the, we're using these micro factories. Um, you know, I just want to touch on that a little bit because that means that we can bring these micro factories to any city around the world. Mm -hmm. And that is a very different proposition than putting large factories, you know, typically out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. We can help work with cities and governments and local communities, you know, hire local talent, pay local taxes, build local product for the mobility, well, for the city and the mobility needs of that, yes. of that city. And that is, um, I think, something that has just never been seen before in the industry. That's awesome. So uh, would you say that uh, one of the biggest thing that's fueling Arriver, is it using technology to make money or using technology to change the world? Oh, it's absolutely changed the world. I mean, we started with that mission of how do you sort of break this, these barriers of entry for uh, folks to build electric vehicles and how do, you, how do you make best in class products so anybody can get into it, anyone. Yeah. You know, what's really important about us doing the bus is that it's for everybody, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, it's not a, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollar sports car, as cool as they are. Yeah. It's something that anyone in any city anywhere can actually interact with our with our products and use them. And you know, commercial vehicle segments growing and it's it is an important market. And yes, of course, we are looking to be uh, leaders in, in our segment and generate revenue. But underlying all of that is how do you you know, really decentralize and democratize the production and design of, of electric vehicles so that it can go everywhere. Because, you know, the worst situation here would be that the price premium for electrification remains and therefore only a select few ever really get the shift over. All right. That's awesome. And, uh, you mentioned earlier about when you were talking about Arriver, just giving a little bit of the background, you talked about how you majority of your workforce is actually engineers. What can you say uh, about a driver that has made that mindset shift from the traditional way to now we're using more so engineers to come up with all these different technologies? Uh, that's a great question. So I think, you know, if I, if I just to clarify the workforce, so, you know, over 1300 people, 90% are engineers of that okay. of software. So, yeah. yeah, so it's 90%, 50% of software, the other 50% is about um, uh, robotics and automotive and, and other technical fields and right. composite materials that we're developing. I think what's really important is blending different industry backgrounds so you can take what works and what, what experience you've seen mm -hmm. and bring that together. And engineers have a phenomenal way of solving problems. I, yeah, I've actually got an engineering background. I know you've got an engineering background. Yep. And we sort of think a little bit, you know, see our problem. It's like, okay, how do we go around and solve it? So our job's really to go and focus on which problems are critical to solve, which are the priority ones to go after, and then let people get as creative as they can. But when you mix a software focus 
with a robotics, mechanical, electronics, engineering, mm -hmm. that's when you start to get things like a micro factory because it's a blend of you know, different disciplines to solve the problem. So I don't see how a rival would have been able to get to where it was if it wasn't so um, strong in its engineering culture and, and team and talent. So to me, yeah, it's critical. And that shift, um, well, to us, it wasn't really a shift. The company was designed that way from the beginning. Um, and software was always a critical part rather than trying to sort of add it on afterwards. Yeah. Everything is sort of software layer. Even now, we design our own internal tools to validate the micro factory. I mean, that's, you know, that's really thinking about what do we need to be able to do what we do. Yeah. All right. So uh, at this point, what um, do you guys have in the pipeline that it's not public yet? <laughs> uh, I would say, I mean, I can't just, unfortunately, I can't say much. Oh, but, come on. But I, I, will, I, I wanted I, some breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> you got some on the, on the, uh, on the headquarters. Yes. Um, yes. I will say, you know, watch this space. When you think about the way these technologies uh, essentially can be repackaged multiple times and built using a micro factory, I think you'll see some really exciting products coming out of Rival. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're making the bus cool. So I think yeah. we, can, um, we can do a lot and you'll see a lot. Now make sure that I, I come on um, and give you some breaking news there, when there I can. There we go. Right, how's that? We're always here ready for you. Um, so now let's, let's switch over to you know, the investor side because that's what a lot of people are going to be looking like, hey, should I buy or not buy? So um, what was the decision of, uh, behind you guys going with uh, CIIG to, for, for the merger? So what was um, interesting about us is I mean, we, we stayed in stealth. We got an investment from Hyundai Kia first. Um, they invested 100 million euros in us. UPS also invested and bought the, um, the, made the, did the vehicle order. And then we also had an investment from, from BlackRock. So uh, we, while we were still private, we had really good backers, really strong backers. Mm -hmm. And what we found in CIIG was a partner, you know, we're very heavy engineering focus. Um, the background of CIIG is really about building brands and scaling companies in particular, mm -hmm. um, running public companies in the US. So we saw a really good synergy and they just believed in the exact same um, mission that we've got. Right. Got it. And so, for example, you know, uh, Peter Cunha, um, who's part of CIIG, the CEO, he's actually going to be part of our board going forward. So we are awesome. you know, really staying close together. This isn't, um, uh, you know, this isn't just a financial transaction. This is a strategic alignment of, of two parties. And, and for us, what was really important is, um, you know, we want to we just focus on developing the product. What, what are the key things here? The talent the culture, the technology, right. and the production operations, right? That's where our focus needs to be. So this was the best strategy for us to raise the capital we need. So, you know, we, we're we looking at um, uh, approximately 660 million in, in total proceeds, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we've got a CapEx light, you know, factory model, right? So that yeah. really goes well in terms of what we need to do to start scaling the business. And we expect to be, you know, cash flow positive by 2023. Yeah. Um, so... This was a partnership, I would say that, you know, we, we just felt really in line on what we were doing. We're, we were evaluating multiple different, you know, avenues. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we met the CIIG uh, team, we just really, uh, really aligned really well. And so, you know, we announced the, the merger with them and, um, you know, closing should happen uh, hopefully sometime. Uh, That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I know you got to go uh, lightning round. Uh, last question, uh, biggest competitor in the space? So I would say, I mean, look, the, the, there are a lot of entrants coming in for the commercial vehicle segment, mm -hmm. but there's, there isn't anyone, I think, taking the approach that a rival's taking. So, you know, when you can produce the vehicles the, the way we can, uh, you know, I'd never say we don't have any competitors, of course we do. Um, but I would say that our, our method and approach is, is, is fundamentally different to anything that's been done before. So I would say that puts us in a pretty unique category and it also enables us to compete in multiple segments that, you know, uh, 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 an, another EV company won't be able to attack as quickly as, as a rival could go after. So go. I think we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a good place. There you go. So basically the answer is when number one, there's no competition. I, I like <laughs> that. <laughs> I, I like that. So I appreciate you coming on. And I would definitely love to bring you back again and just continue to, 
uh, talk about the, you know, the amazing work that you guys are, are doing out there um, at the river. So uh, yeah, so whenever, feel free uh, you know, to reach out and you know, if there's anything that you, you think that you know, all the investors out there need to know about River, we're here uh, to get that conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. And um, look, again, uh, before I sign off here, uh, what, what impressed me was, you know, you really understood um, not the going public part, but mm -hmm. you understood what we were actually doing um, quite well. So I wanted to come on and, and have the chat with you. So I appreciate the time and keep doing good work. And to all the viewers, this guy knows his stuff. So pay attention. Appreciate it. All right. So guys, you guys got it. That was uh, Mr. Avinash, uh, president of Arriver here on the channel. And so if you do have any questions, um, you know, about Arriver as a company, just leave those in the comment section. We'll definitely make sure that his team gets those questions back to him and we'll get some answers for you. Um, and also you can check out, uh, they are on social media. You can definitely reach out and ask any questions. Uh, go to the website. There's a ton of information there. Um, even the investor presentation, I'm going to put that in the uh, description below the link there. So you guys can definitely go read. Um, to me, again, this company is not just a traditional company. This is a technology company that is changing the way we do uh, EV car manufacturing. So definitely go check them out. And, and as always, guys, don't be a greedy savage and stay motivated. <laughs>